Hey guys, Jordan here, again as usual. Finally uh, back in action here. Spent uh, two days ago, just came down with like a 24 hour flu and was laid out for the whole night. Uh, recovered enough the next day to uh, watch the kids while my wife was in sick. So um, yeah, it was kind of a chaotic last couple of days. Ended up having to uh, cancel uh, the webinar that was scheduled for yesterday. Now we have rescheduled that for uh, next Thursday. So ultimately no harm done in the grand scheme of things. If you guys signed up for that webinar that was supposed to be yesterday, it was canceled due to uh, due to that flu that hit. So uh, just head to freerecordingclass.com if you want to jump on the next one next week. And uh, fingers crossed, everything should be good. Hopefully the, this uh, bug is uh, out of the house. So I um, wanted to talk to you guys about uh, one of the topics that I cover in that webinar, uh, by the way, uh, again, freerecordingclass.com, and that is that you need to be tracking in a way that makes your mixes that much easier. And there might be some tracking decisions that you're making right now that you might think are actually uh, beneficial to what you're doing. You might think that these decisions are actually uh, giving you more options and making your mixes better and uh, it's actually doing the opposite it's making your mixes it's making your mixing process way more difficult on yourself and it's not making it any better so who would want anything that makes things harder and uh, worse right so I think you know I'll talk about a few decisions I mean the obvious one is kind of comes under the general umbrella of fixing it in the mix so if you ever are tracking and I, I know that you've probably had this situation I used to have it all the time before I figured this out and it would be basically this thing in your head that says oh I'll fix it later now that could be performance that could be editing uh, that could be the actual sound itself which is more so what I'm referring to here and uh, but definitely performance has, a, has an impact there uh, but in terms of the actual sounds you're capturing for sure if you're ever sitting there in front of your speakers in a tracking session and you're saying you're, ca you're capturing a sound, you're dialing in a tone, maybe it's getting a little frustrating, right? It's taking a little too long to dial in that tone. And you think, you know what, whatever, we gotta, we gotta keep this moving, I'll fix it later, or I'll make it better later. Every time you do that, and I'm sure you've had this experience, you finally get to the mix stage, and lo and behold, it's not what you want it to sound like. Big surprise, you're saying that, you know, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a surprise because in, during the time when you're dialing in the tone in the first place, you knew it wasn't right and then you just went ahead anyway. So that's making your mixes a lot harder because now you've got to somehow try to mangle it with EQ and compression and plug in and do all this stuff to try and make it how you wanted it in the first place. Or you've got to go back and, you know, reamp stuff or, or whatever or, you know, take the raw sound and put it through something else and basically go back and start again, um, which is uh, it's just a waste of time. Um, so anytime you think that, I'm going to fix this in the mix, uh, you know, that should be like a signal. I, I eventually, I used to do this all the time and um, big surprise, my mixes weren't sounding how I wanted them to, right? So I kind of realized this and I started training myself that anytime I had that thought, anytime I thought that ah, this isn't working, I'll just fix it later. That was like, I made that be like alarm bells in my brain. It's like ding, 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 ding. Um, you know, you're avoiding something difficult right now. And uh, that never works out. Um, so if you train yourself to just like react to that thought again the I'll fix it in the mix thought as a uh, big time red flag and alarm bells in your head uh, then that's going to help you avoid making those bad decisions about postponing things to later um, along those lines you know a couple specific ways that people are doing this um, one big one is reamping now I don't have anything against reamping necessarily uh, I know that for a lot of people they have to do that because maybe they don't have good ISO booth or a space or they can't record a loud guitar amp you know at certain times of the day or at all and so they'll take a DI and use an amp sim and then they'll go and reamp later I think that is a good plan that is that's great if that's your situation but if you have a scenario where you can record a live amp and that's what you're gonna do in the end anyway um, to me there's absolutely no reason why you wouldn't just do that in the first place right and I you know from way back, uh, I always recorded DIs along with the guitar tracks, and um, a lot of the reasoning was just so that I could see things easier on screen, so I could, you know, move stuff around and whatever. But, um, you know, the secondary reason was always, you know, okay, well, if I if I get to the mix and I just I don't like this tone, then I'll I can reamp it later. 
And on the surface, that seems good, but I'll, I gotta tell you, in many, many years of making records, I probably reamped like two, three, maybe four times. And that's because we always put the effort into getting the tone right, right up front. And man, there's nothing I, I grew to hate more than like getting something up front and then getting to the mix stage and having to go back and do it all over again. Like what a waste of time. Like that's such a headache to me. If you're, you know, just getting a so-so tone, you don't really care about because you're going to reamp it later. Um, I think that this is just laziness in the moment and you're just setting yourself up for more work later. I mean, how many times do we do that? Like across all different areas of life, right? You know, putting something difficult off right now so that we can do it later when, you know, it should be easier or we have more time, you know, generally it doesn't work like that. You still got to find the tone eventually, right? So you might as well get it right up front and then save yourself all those hours in the mix process, not having to reamp it, right? Now, is it good to have the DI as, back, as backup so that, you know, if you find yourself having to do a massive amount of EQ in the mix, then you can just reamp it instead? Yeah, that might be a good option. But like I said, if you actually take a little extra time to try and get it right during tracking, you probably won't even have to do that at all. So that's my opinion on that. Another thing that's maybe making your mixing way more difficult is you're giving yourself way too many options, meaning a lot of people. And I think this is one of those things that's often portrayed as like, as a pro, um, as a pro technique, but it's actually uh, very opposite. It's actually a very amateur technique. And that is um, just recording multiple mics on everything so that you can get what you need later when you're mixing. And it sounds impressive at first. It makes you look cool. You know, if you've got a guitar amp in the studio, you're the band and uh, you've got like six mics on the cab. I mean, that's, that's kind of crazy. Even if you've got two or three, let's say you've got three mics on the cab, you know, you've got a dynamic, you've got another one at a different angle. And then you've got like a condenser there. Maybe you've got one further back from the amp. Maybe you put one behind the amp if it's like one of those open back amps. And uh, you know, it looks really cool. And you know, you can be like, tell the band, oh, I'm blending this mic in this. Oh, it sounds so good. And then you record all of those sources and then you get to the mix and you're trying to, you're no longer just dealing with one guitar track. You're dealing with like three or four different mics and then you're trying to blend those again. And you know, well, how much should I have of this? Well, maybe if I turn this up, but that makes it kind of muddy. So maybe if I EQ that, it's, it just becomes a mess and it's way harder to mix like that. If you're going to use multiple mics, I recommend getting something that you can actually combine those down to one track on the way in as you're tracking. But generally, I think you can just record with one mic. Um, when I was watching John Fields produce and engineer the Jonas Brothers mix, he had a 57 and a Royer up on the cab. And I was like, okay, cool. That's like standard setup. You know, blend the 57 and the Royer to get a nice fat tone. But no, he never did that. For every guitar track they were going to track, he would pick up the guitar and then he would play a little bit. He would put the 57 up, then put that down, put the 121 up. And then he would just choose whatever one fit the part the best. And then he only use that one mic. Never did he blend them ever. And that kind of blew my mind. And I started going just down to one mic on most of my productions. And, uh, man, I gotta tell you, it makes a big difference. If you force yourself to just keep it simple and get the right sound with the least amount of steps necessary, um, then it's really, you know, it's, you're really going to find that your mixing becomes way easier. And uh, specifically about guitars, about miking them and stuff, you can see an actual demo of how I do that on a real project with a real band. Uh, and now we'd set up a single mic on the cab, where to put it, and then dial in tone in about five minutes and have a killer tone. Uh, that's going to be in the upcoming webinar that I'm doing, freerecordingclass.com. You'll be able to see exactly how to do that there during that close that class. Uh, but yeah, that's what I'm doing most of the time, just just one mic. And it goes for all other, source, all other sources, right? It could be drums, whatever, especially vocals. I mean, if you're using multiple mics on vocals, man, that just screams amateur to me. It's like... It's not that hard to just try two or three mics, you know, take a few minutes, try them out, whatever one sounds best, boom, you roll with it. You got to make decisions. That's what it all comes down to. Are you making decisions during tracking that set you up to get the sound that you want in the final mix? You know, the, the thing is, is that people treat mixing, and I used to, as this like magical step that like completely reinvents what what is there, right? So you could potentially just record a bunch of random sounds and then Finally, when it's time to mix it by yourself, you can transform it into anything you want. That's how a lot of people treat it. And then, you know, they get surprised when they have a million mix notes from the band because, you know, it doesn't sound how they expected. Well, no wonder you've replaced every single sound that you got during tracking, right? Um, and again, going back to that Jonas Brothers project, yeah, 
that record went on to be mixed by Chris Lord Algae, and I was in the room while it was being tracked. And let me tell you, I was expecting a dramatically different sound of the mix when I went and checked out that final record. Because I'm thinking, man, it's mixed by CLA. He's going to put all the samples on. You know, he's going to do his thing. I got to tell you, that record sounded 80% the same as what it sounded like in the tracking room. Like, seriously. Drums sounded pretty much the same as I remember, just a little hyped up, a little shinier, more polished. Um, <clears throat> you know, it was that extra 20%. It wasn't a total makeover on the sound. It was like everything was pretty much there. And then the mixer just kind of added that extra sweetness and energy to it. That's how you should be approaching it. You know, you should not be thinking that you're going to dramatically change everything and change every guitar tone and every drum sound and, you know, just make this massive, massively different sound during the mixing stage. Basically what you end up at the end of, end up with at the end of tracking should be 80% to your final mix. And then mixing becomes really easy and uh, really fun because you're no longer trying to fix things and make decisions that you put off. You know, you're not trying to decide which mic out of the three that you use, <laughs> you know, which, which one you should go with and then which, uh, or how much you should blend them together. Um, and you're not deciding, you know, which version of takes, you know, if you're keeping multiple takes or something that should all be decided during tracking. All right. You should almost treat yourself, you know, if you're tracking and mixing your own projects, you should treat yourself as like, just imagine that you're a, a third party mixer. So you're not involved in tracking at all. What are you going to send them? Right? Like if you were sending these tracks to another mixer, you don't want them making all the decisions. If you're the producer and engineer, like you want to get the sounds as close to what you think it should be and then send it to the mixer so they can take it the rest of the way, right? You should be treating it the same way for yourself. So during tracking, you should be getting sounds that are very, very close to what you want in the final mix. Don't ever put off decisions. Jeez, even sometimes I'll get stuff to mix and there'll be like four mics on the guitar cab. I gotta be honest with you guys, I don't waste any time with that. Um, and I don't, I don't tell the engineers of the band this, but like if I get five different guitar mics on a, on a mix, like I will literally just be playing the track and I'll put each one up one at a time and I'll choose whatever one sounds closest to what I want and I will literally delete the rest. Um, same with like most of the time if there's like four sets of drum room mics, I'm going to choose the one or two that sound the best and just get rid of the rest. You don't have to use everything and uh, <clears throat> so that's a tip maybe if you're just mixing stuff. But yeah, if you're, if you're tracking and mixing it, then set yourself up for an easy mix. Make decisions in the moment, okay? Get really good at making fast and firm, clear decisions during tracking and you'll set yourself up for a much more enjoyable and better and easier mix. I'm sure you guys would agree. If you want to see some of this stuff in action and go under the hood on some of my projects to see how that really plays out in real life, um, check out my next webinar. It's going to be a live session. I'm doing it next week. Um, but no matter when you're watching this, even if it's way down the road, you can still get access to that because I'm going to be doing these for a while. Um, so head over to freerecordingclass.com. See when the next session is. Sign up there. Hope to see you there. Um, but there's one thing to take away from this is that, you know, make sure that your tracking style and the decisions you're making on, during tracking or lack of decisions you're making during tracking isn't making your mixes a lot harder and frankly, a lot worse. All right. Get good at making decisions in the studio. Everyone will thank you for it, including yourself. All right, guys. Take care.